It won't stay there. I'm telling you guys, I just can't. Well, you don't have to wear it. The woman with the obstreperous name tag is Melinda Snodgrass. She was the executive story editor of Star Trek Next Generation, and she is kind enough to actually appear with us on NeverEndingPanel.com. Melinda, what other things have you done besides, well, the big, huge thing, Star Trek? <laughs> Star Trek. The elephant in the room? Mention them briefly, and then we'll talk about the other thing. Okay, I was, uh, I was on Reasonable Doubts. I was a co-executive producer on Profiler. I've written a lot of pilots, and I've written episodes, and I've done some feature films that never got made, but were a lot of fun to do. So that's my background in Hollywood. But I started in a book tradition, went to Hollywood, got wheelbarrow loads of money, went back to books. Oh, we're working mm -hmm. on the we wheelbarrow loads. Wheel 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 wheel. I like that we part skip, of the story. We skipped that. We skipped it down right over that, Aton. We'll, we'll hit her up for that. How, how to do that? that we have the empty wheelbarrow right now. <laughs> yeah, well, that's because so we're the credit card bills. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I understand you have a new book that's coming out. Do you, can you tell us about it? Right. It's um, actually a sequel to The Edge of Reason, which was uh, it's it's called The Edge of Ruin. It's coming out in April, uh, and basically. It was my reaction to a celebration on the eve of the millennial, uh, in Millennium in 1999, and I was sitting with my friends and a bunch of writers, and we were drinking margaritas and watching the fireworks go on around drinking. the world. A shock! <laughs> oh it's a horrible secret. Um, and I thought, wait a minute, we're about to enter the 21st century. You know, where is my moon base? Where is my air car? I don't have any of this. And and I live in Jet New Mexico. Jetpacks. Yes, jet 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 <laughs> rocket boots. But um, I kept thinking, I live in a state in which People hire psychics to tell them how their horse is feeling, and who believe in crystal power, and who have you know think they have guardian angels. And I thought, I'm what thinking this happened? is Arizona, actually New Mexico, New Mexico, Santa Fe, enough, very right, woo-woo. Right. And I thought there has to be an explanation. This just can't be because we're so stupid as a species <laughs> we would actually go this way and get dumber as as we progress. There is a movie. So <laughs> I thought you know there must be an explanation, and that was sort of the genesis of this book idea, which is the battle between reason and science and rationality and religion and superstition on the other side in this sort of age-long war that's been going on. I so, love it. I love that concept. I'm reading um, a book called Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot in which he sort of talks about science and spirituality and paranormal, um, you know, blending all of it together. Right. And it, right, it's been a source of contention uh, for quite some time. Um, very interesting. Uh, what, so, what, 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 yeah. so you came up with this idea in 1999. It's 2010. Does it take that long to write an original concept in science fiction? No, it just takes that long sometimes to get it sold. Hey, uh, dude, it took us like uh, 10 years. So. <laughs> it, it Give does. her a break, man. <laughs> Actually, eight. Eight. Almost eight years exactly. Well, cut her some slap, dude. Um, so, what were uh, you know, what were some of the themes that came up in here that you were thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that? Because that this is the third rail, really. Once you start getting into religion and science. Yeah. Well, what I did, I mean, when I initially got the concept for the book, I, I was trying to cheat. You know, I was trying to say, well, it's Odin and it's this other stuff. And then I thought, you know, no, if you're going to take on religion, you have to take on religion. So, you know, I talk about the so, big J. Um, take a shower, grab that third rail, and, so just, and, go, for and go for it. And amazing, I mean, I was actually kind of hoping that I would be burned in effigy or they would, you know, they would rail against my books on the 700 Club or something. But unfortunately, it never happened. So I never got the huge sales that would have been generated. Um, it was so, annoyingly tolerant American Christians. What's wrong with that? I, I was amazed. This woman's I, criticizing you. I really was. And I mean, I, you know, I have a character in the book, Cross, who's actually a. A manifestation of Jesus Christ who lives in a cardboard box out behind Prometheus's office building because he has this tendency to shatter into pieces every time there's a you know a bombing at a Hindu temple and then there's you know some other event in Jerusalem and then the crazy Christianists decide to beat up a gay kid and kill him in Wyoming then you know the the this avatar of the merciful Jesus just flies into pieces and so he has to live outside and and I'm actually writing a story about him now where he's sort of a hard-boiled noir detective in 1934 <laughs> and I'm going, oh, I love it. Jesus, hard-boiled detective. Uh, so, you ought to protest. Yeah. Somebody my name's Christ. You know, Jesus somebody Christ. Somebody burned my book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody have a book burning. Um, I was really surprised because I was actually concerned enough that I, you know, I went with the unlisted number and I had a P.O. box because everybody was saying, oh my God, you're right. nothing. So, all right. But people who read it seem to like it. That's been nice. So I have a sort of a, 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 a side question. Anytime I've had the pleasure of interviewing on Never Ending Panel, Rob Sawyer, mm -hmm. who, as you know now, has his Flash Forward TV show on. And we had asked him, what was it like being a solo writer and now being thrown into a crew and having to write that way 
because he's become part of, I guess, the staff writers, and that's how we sort of get him into the panel in L.A. So you're going the opposite. You you were used to writing with a team, and now I guess you're yeah, writing one of the solo. most constricted Bibles in yeah. television. Yeah. Right, and now you you you've gone from that team and getting all that and. and Obviously, if I'm so not Jesus Christ, I can't imagine not collaborating. So it gives you a lot more freedom. You know? So, yeah, what has that experience been, essentially, from the team to solo? Frightening, you know, interesting, uh, well, I, re-liberating. I wrote books you know. before I went to Hollywood. Gotcha. And so I, I actually like being on a show. I like the energy of being in a room with other writers and throwing ideas out. I mean, we have a tradition that started actually on Star Trek, ironically, which we call the dumb stick. Because I had this sort of glittery wand thing that somebody gave me as a good luck piece when I got my job. And, and we were trying to break a new Star Trek episode. And, and, you know, you're just throwing out ideas. And some of them are just stupid as hell. But you kind of go, well, okay. And one of the writers said, give me that dumb stick. And then he held it and he said something really stupid. But from that sort of dumb idea, we went to, we, we said, well, yeah, that doesn't quite work. But if we did this other thing, it would be great. And so I love that kind of energy. Because sometimes... I'm sitting there at the computer staring at the screen and I'm going, I don't know how to do this scene. Is this just awful? I have no, and if I can walk down the hall to right. a fellow writer's office and go, does this make any sense at all? And I can sort of talk through the scene with them and they'll go, yeah, but you know, maybe you ought to think of it from this other angle or what right. if you started it here. And you don't have that luxury as, as, a, as a solo novelist. I mean, right. we have a writer's group. We meet once a month and that's great. But it's that immediate help, that immediate yes. feedback that you can get. So. I actually love it. Now, if you're really precious about your deathless prose, then this is not for you because you know the executive producer is going to rewrite you. Right. I mean, you, you just know that going in. They're going to run it through the typewriter before it goes to the set. You know, if you're lucky, it doesn't happen on reasonable doubts. I never got rewritten, and that was a real relief. But right. I know that with, uh, because Aton and I, our collaborative team, if he's not available with his phone, like, because, you know, I get so frustrated because I'm used to having this sort of, I want the instant answer, pick up the damn phone. I need to know where, where you wanted to go, what was your thinking here, because I'm stuck on How something. How would he react to this? How situation? would you react to that? And, you know, ring, 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 you know. Hello, we appreciate how you're not here. However, if you leave a message, I'll get back to you when I give a crap. <laughs> okay, on that note, thank you, Melinda, very much for being on NeverEndingPanel.com. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Nice meeting you, Aton. Nice meeting you, Aton.